government, audience, the whole nine yards, as we say in Boston. <laughs> um, Hello, 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 and welcome. Welcome to the American Theater Wing's Network for Emerging Leaders in the Theater for tonight's panel, COVID-19 Safety Officers and Guidelines. I'm Melissa Cabrero, Program Associate here at the Wing. Uh, we're so glad that you're all able to join us for this really relevant and timely uh, panel topic, whether you're a new or returning network member. And I see we have lots of new folks with us tonight. So welcome. Uh, we've got educators, students, program alum, as well as emerging and established industry professionals joining us from across the country tonight. Also joining us are members of our Board of Trustees and Advisory Committee. And a big thank you to everyone who participated in our polls right at the top of the meeting. It's great to see that there are folks joining us from all regions of the country and even international audiences. Um, and so we're so, so thrilled to have you. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Alicia. Hello, I am Alicia Vaninchak. I am a programs associate at The Wing. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time tonight, the Network for Emerging Leaders in the Theater is one of The Wing's educational professional development programs, which fosters a supportive and creative community for arts administrators and managers in our field. Through the network, these aspiring students, interns, and young professionals can connect with and learn from panels of esteemed industry colleagues, theater companies, and other leaders in the New York and national theater scenes. The American Theater Wing is a nonprofit organization, and we sustain ourselves and programs such as the network on charitable contributions. If you are in a position to make a contribution, uh, you can visit americantheaterwing.org and click on the donate button. If you are not in a position to donate, we completely understand that these are difficult times. When we release this network recording on YouTube and Facebook, we would so appreciate it if you would share the video with friends, leave a comment, invite others to our next meeting to help us spread the importance of theater and the power of the arts. And so without further ado, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our guest moderator. She's a producer, someone we've had the pleasure of working with for our annual gala for the last 11 seasons and just an overall firecracker of a human being, Lauren Klaschneider. Hi, Lauren. <laughs> So since March 2020, Lauren has been involved with creating live and virtual events tailored to our current times and has become a COVID compliance officer. Her current COVID underlining philosophy is that in the theater, we make safe spaces for artists to create. And this safe space refers to the physical and the psychological. COVID-19 greatly threatens that safety. And our new task is to create ways to mitigate uh, the risk for health reasons and for the creative process to flourish. She believes that COVID-19 has created for us the strongest bond between art and science. Thank you for hosting. Thank you to the American Theater Wing for making this happen. Thank you to the staff. Thank you to the network. And thank you to the audience who wants to be exposed and continue to keep us all in the live theater world. So thanks to the yeah. Wing. Thank you again, Lauren. And it is now my pleasure to welcome our panelists to the screen. Um, and I'd like to take a moment to introduce each of these esteemed professionals as they uh, come to the screen. Uh, so as they are joining us now, uh, we've got Hilary Long, who is the production manager at New York Theater Workshop. We've got Kate McGuire, who is the artistic director and CEO of Berkshire Theater Group. And we have Ken McGee, who is a stage manager and the current safety officer for The Music Man. Thank you all for being here with us tonight for this conversation. And I'm happy to turn the conversation over to Lauren. Thank you. I, um, I had the privilege of meeting with the panelists a little bit ago, and I had to just get right out there how extraordinarily overwhelmed I am by what you're doing. And you're making things happen where many, many, many thought they couldn't. So thank you. It's thrilling, invigorating, inspiring. And let, let's start with Hillary at New York Theater Workshop, 
who has been involved in loadouts while also running a current scene shop and costume shop. So explain to us process, safety procedures, and perhaps some hiccups you may have run into. Yeah, thanks Lauren and everyone at The Wing and the network for inviting me into this conversation. Um, I'm really excited for everyone here tonight because I think that um, all four of us sit in a really unique spot in the industry and I think that between myself, Ken, Kate, and Lauren, you'll see kind of the progression of how we're returning to making art. Um, and so I, I guess that I kind of represent that first phase of um, production crews and technicians. Um, we, in the past month, um, actually I'll start back in March, back in March of 2020, um, as all of you will remember, between, in a matter of an afternoon, we had three shows running and then suddenly nothing. Um, and so at that point, we had three shows in our spaces and we just let them sit there because at first we thought it was gonna be a two week shutdown. Then we thought it was gonna be a 30 day shutdown, then a 90 day. And it became clear that this was not something that was going to be able to pass. Um, and so at that point, starting in about August, we realized that we had come to the point in New York City where um, the, positive, the percentage rate of positive tests was getting low enough that we felt comfortable coming back into the spaces. There was enough information coming out um, from IOTC and from other unions and from um, other theaters um, providing some guidelines for how we might safely return to work. Um, and so we made the decision to go in and load out two of those shows. Um, and at the same time, we have a fully operational costume and scene shop that have been taking on small projects and things like that. Um, and so it's been incredibly straightforward, actually. And that's largely because we've spent months planning for it, I guess you could say, um, that after taking in all the information and funneling it through and really sticking with the basics of wearing a face covering, physically distancing and reducing the number of people in spaces, um, we were able to pretty successfully accomplish um, all of the work that we needed to do without um, really changing a lot of the way that we did it. I can go into a little bit more of that later, but I think that um, I'll let everyone else maybe introduce themselves first, but. One, one quick little follow-up question. Yeah. Have you been working with COVID compliance officers? Have you been man managing it in-house and people being trained? How are you dealing with that? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, at the start of the shutdown, I kind of took it upon myself to get really involved in um, tracking the course of this pandemic and its effects on our industry. And so I've been super fortunate to be able to be in community with not only other folks who are in the Off-Broadway League, but also um, other arts organizations throughout New York City talking about how the pandemic is progressing. And so we've been tapped into those kind of conversations. Um, and from there, we learned about the COVID compliance officer training that's offered by Health Education, I believe is the company, um, that is focused primarily on film. And so that was kind of the first training that's come out and it's kind of, I think, still the premier compliance officer training that's offered that is film focused, but um, myself and two other um, folks on the operations and production team have taken that training course. So we have that certification um, and have used that knowledge to translate over to the work that we do in theater. Thank you. Okay, Kate, you have gone where no one has gone before. And I feel like you really, really led the way at the Berkshire Theater Group with your production of Godspell. Will you give us some insight as to the concept of working with government and that being part of the partnership, as well as conceiving of the show within this realm, as well as relationship to the audience? Government, audience, the whole nine yards, as we say in Boston. <laughs> um, we, um, Berkshire County went under in March pretty early 
as bizarre as it may seem, Pittsfield was declared one of the ninth, um, the top 10 hotspots in late March, which was kind of peculiar because we're so small here in terms of population. So the community got hit early and um, like everyone else, we emptied out. In April, like everyone else, and I thought it was interesting, Lauren, when you talked about theater and science, because you know, a lot of us always think about theater as a laboratory. None of us really thought we were gonna to have to become public health experts. Um, but gradually, I think that's what we've become. And like Hillary said, I just started trying to understand the pandemic, the course of the pandemic, not only here in Berkshire County, but in New York in the epicenter and, and where it was, how it was looking around the world actually so that I could have a sense perhaps of what the ebbs and flows might be. And as I began to look out, I thought that by August, end of July, we might be in a more secure position to be able to get some work done outdoors. And so we submitted a plan to equity. It was a 15 page document and we were denied. And when I had a longer conversation with equity about why we were denied, it became clear that the union was interested in trying to get something open. They had hired Dr. Michaels and they had these sort of stipulations about opening. And at that point, Berkshire County was already dropping in terms of its numbers. And so they were willing to open a door to us to begin a discussion. And the discussion was daily and it lasted for two months. So over the, a two month period, our company manager, who is our COVID compliance officer, and I went back and forth, whether it was through emails or phone conversations, talking about how to make it safe. And also wearing my artistic hat I, it was important to me to get the production of Godspell done because I felt that somehow would speak to the times that we're living in. The director of that show was really looking at it and framing it in terms of COVID and where we are now. And so everything sort of conspired at the same time and all forces just allowed us to bring the production to fruition and so the actors arrived at the end of July and we got the production up. We extended for a couple of weeks. So the actors left on September the 20th. They had begun August 19th, I think it was. And everyone left safely, the audiences, the community and the actors, not without a lot of stress, which we can talk about also at some point, I imagine. The, the level of stress um, was incredible, trying to manage everyone and make sure everyone was safe and understanding the responsibility of what we were doing. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna say in terms of the government, the government was part of the process all along. Were there conflicts with the government at all or, or were, were your opposed, they were opposed. The, uh, the mayor of Pittsfield, who we were working closely with, as well as the local hospital officials, the mayor of Pittsfield was supportive all along. I mean, she did keep saying, Kate, you have to keep everyone safe. Please keep everyone safe. Um, the governor, who's in Boston, three hours away, was dealing with a much more difficult and complicated situation in terms of COVID. So the numbers were increasing in Boston while our numbers were coming down and he didn't wanna do a regional approach. So we were only allowed a hundred people. And then on opening day, he lowered the numbers and we were only allowed 50 people in the audience. So it wasn't a moneymaker, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. It never is. We'll come back to that. There's so much to dive into. Thank you. And um, Ken, as you're at Music Man in rehearsal, stage manager turned COVID officer, perfect combination of skills, knowledge, ability, sensitivities, understanding. 
let us know what's going on in rehearsal and how this is being managed with COVID. Um, it's, it's, I will, I will first and foremost say that it has been amazing to be in a room where art is being created and um, every, after so long and every single person in the room feels that and is, and is incredibly grateful. Um, that being said, it is hard um, because as you said, you know, we, uh, you know, theater is a safe space and it's, it's everyone's job to create a safe space for the actors and Unfortunately, there is this, now this added element of uh, safety precautions and protocols that have to be followed um, that every single day I try very hard for it not to interfere with the process of the actors, you know, the director, the choreographer, but unfortunately the nature of it is that, that it is going to, and, and that's that can be can be hard, you know, when you have to go, you know, after an actor, you know, does a eight minute dance break and then starts singing again and has to go and, you know, and rest after that. And you have to remind them to keep their mask up or to keep six feet away from someone else and, and you know, all of that. It, it just can, you feel like you're hindering the process, you know what I'm saying? And so that's been hard. And as Kate was saying, the stress, and, you know, we take uh, weekly COVID tests and so like, you know, every week, you know, those COVID tests go out and then they come back and we get the results and we're, you know, I'm grateful, <laughs> you know, for another week of everyone staying healthy because we are, um, we are not in a bubble, you know, we are rehearsing. It's a developmental um, workshop, basically what we're doing. And so it's four weeks and we're in the rehearsal room for four weeks. Everybody's going home, they're living their lives, they're coming, you know, to the rehearsal space in the morning so we're not in a bubble. And so there's, of course, a million other, uh, you know, things that, you know, we have to worry about and stuff like that. But, um, but at the end of the day, it's been amazing. You know, I, I, everyone's very grateful and it's really wonderful. What's exciting about hearing all of you talk is the knowledge that we can create theater during COVID. Mm -hmm. It may not be financially viable. It can be safe enough. There's not anything that's 100% safe short of staying in. So there's all these precautions to take. And what I'm finding thrilling is the knowledge and the support and the um, excitement and thrill that theater can be created. And we need to continue to work on about how to do it. Testing has come up. If each of you could address how you've been managing testing, whether it be a single lab, sending people out, are you, are they having to bring a form telling you that they've been tested? Kind of, for each of you, how is that being handled? Um, so we, testing was not a component of um, the work that we were doing with the technicians. Um, and that's entirely because everyone was able to keep their masks on. Um, and we were able to physically distance as much as possible. Um, not to diverge, but I wanted to point out, Lauren, as, as we were also, at the same time that we're celebrating the art that we're able to be making, I would um, hazard to forget everyone who is not able to be doing the work that um, we've trained our entire lives to do. And so um, I think that part of our entire ethos at least my ethos in um, putting together COVID safety guidelines and um, undertaking the task of um, restarting work is that uh, it is a community endeavor, that um, pandemic safety is a community task and that only one of us is safe when all of us are safe. Um, and that's true um, as we as an industry try and get back to work. Um, and so like, I hope that the folks of the, those of us here gathered on this screen can be a shining light and give some hope to all to everyone else who's um, looking forward to that day when they can get their feet back on on a stage. Um, but the, to your actual question, testing was not a component to the work that we did, and actually testing is the um, primary reason why we haven't been able to re-engage in in-person programming of any sort filming, um, readings, anything like that. It's because of the, um, how cost prohibitive it is to get the volume of testing that we need. But so, I'll let, yeah. 
Right. So Hillary, it's not that testing isn't available, it's the cost to the theater and the cost of production. Correct. That, because the, the you know. producer employer is responsible for getting enough testing for everyone. And that is um, at least once a week for everyone who's involved in the production and then up to three times a week for those who are in close proximity. Um, and that is, and it's not sending someone to urgent care and getting a test and reimbursing them. It is, you have to form your own contract with a lab or get folks individual tests. Um, and that, it, that adds up very quickly. So Kate, for your theater, in the Berkshires, how did you manage it? First off, with the actors mm -hmm. who are unmasked when they're doing their work and then those around them and then the sort of like the next layer out. Because it was all so early and so new, our actors were actually tested. They had to be tested before they came. They had to be in quarantine three weeks, two weeks rather, before they came. Um, and then tested again right before the first rehearsal. After that, the actors were tested three times a week. The hospital is only five minute drive. And so our company manager would drive them all to be tested. And um, we had set up an agreement, as Hillary was saying, we set up an agreement with the hospital. It was, it, it's been an, a huge expense. They, you know, every time we would add more tests, a costume would go because the expenses of the tests were getting so high. <clears throat> However, um, we tested all of the actors and everyone directly involved in that bubble three times a week. Outside of that, folks were tested as often as they wanted. Most were every other week or something like that, but the staff was tested frequently. The audience's temperatures were all taken. Masks were worn at all times. In our particular case, because it was a musical, there was always 10 feet of distance between the actors on the stage. The actors each had their own spot, so no actor ever sat in another person's chair. They all had their own defined space. And the last piece that went in were these actually really beautiful screens that were moved around the stage. And, and because the play was set in the time of COVID, the audience just immediately became accustomed to, oh, we're in COVID, so there's screens and there's masks. And when the actors were singing, because there was 25 feet between the actors and the audience, and there were these screens between the actors themselves, they could take off their masks. So everything was very finely choreographed. The actors all lived in a house together in their own bubble. And at this point, what we're looking at, because we're trying to get another production up, are tests two times a week. The difficulty for us, and I don't know if you've experienced this, Ken, but we did well over 300 tests during the time of Godspell. And the average rate of a false positive is 5%. So 5% out of 100. And during that time, we had five false positives. And every time it happened, it was heart stopping. And then we would have to wait for the actors to get negative tests. The understudy would go in. It all worked out and everyone was safe at the end and no one actually ultimately tested positive. But those moments were probably the most hair raising. Hey, can I ask what kind of tests you, you were using three times a week? So we were using the test with the long swab that goes right up to the brain. Mm -hmm. Like um, the self-administered ones? Yeah. No, oh, the no, ones that a no, nurse actually. Ones are yeah. shorter. The yeah. ones that we're working with now will be the shorter ones that mm -hmm. are self-administered that you order online. Mm -hmm. So it may be a little easier. The tests themselves were each they were at least $100 a piece and still are $100 a piece. Yeah, yeah. I think testing is going to continue to evolve. We hope that testing catches up with our desire to be together to work. Exactly. And that it becomes more accurate and that it also becomes more financially manageable. And that's where science is on the race to mm -hmm. continue to move that forward. 
Ken, I realized you guys are um, in a developmental workshop and it's four weeks. What's the process or the requirements there? Um, well, we have a uh, set of protocols that we're following that was um, developed and agreed upon by uh, the league and Act as Equity. And the protocol said that anyone who's in the, uh, who's doing the workshop, the lab, um, has to quarantine for two weeks prior and be tested three times in those two weeks. And then during the course of the workshop, be tested once a week. Um, so we are using um, the Pixel test. Everyone orders them. They get them delivered to their house. They, they self-administer it um, in the morning. They bring it to rehearsal, and then we FedEx it. Um, and then we get the results two to three days later. Now, here's what <laughs> I guess we're all, it's all a big learning curve for all of us. So the one thing that I have learned is that when um, do, you're doing these types of tests that um, you know, nothing is necessarily reliable. So um, Fed Federal Express is not necessarily reliable. The lab can get backlogged. And now both of those things have happened with us um, where we have not gotten our results in the time that is stated in our protocols, which is 48 hours after the test is taken. So we've had to go and um, get rapid tests done. So, you know, disrupt rehearsal, get rapid tests done so we can continue rehearsal. So the, uh, that is the one thing that I would like, um, that I would advise, like, you know, like if you're, if anyone is going to do self-administered tests that are going to be mailed, that they, you know, see how reliable, you know, like just know that it's not going to be 100% reliable and you might not get the results in the timely fashion that you need. Um, but that being said, um, Kate, you said that I'm like, my heart is like racing. We actually have not, knock wood, um, gotten any, any false positives yet, but we are getting our final results either tomorrow or Friday. So I will be um, now really anxiously waiting the, the results. But, um, but on the whole, everyone I, you know, has been safe and everyone, you know, our protocols also state that the, um, you know, everyone who's involved should be, you know, quarantining as much as, as they can and, and avoiding large groups and, and all of that stuff. So um, everyone has, is, is being, has luckily been very safe and we're, we've been lucky. Thinking about the role of the actor and how frequently they manage their whole day around being prepared for that performance when they sleep, when they eat, when they bathe, when they, you know, go to the gym. And it's an additional element to be able to also stay safe as much as possible, as much as we can when we're not just living um, okay. in a quarantine environment. And it feels as though we are all able to learn something from the actors in that way, in that they have always used their, their instrument as their vehicle. And we're all having to do that in a similar way. We can, um, I think, learn from them. I'm, I'm curious, Hillary, as you're continuing to make the, the work in the shop and the work in the costume shop, are you finding um, obstacles that are beyond sort of comprehension or surprises as you're creating this new way to work? That's a great question. I mean, the reality is, is that our loadout took about four times as long as it would have in the middle of a season. And that's because we had to fully stagger our crews. So for example, um, our, we, we've reduced our number of crews. So we would have six carpenters working in the space for eight hours. And then we would leave the theater empty overnight so that it could essentially any kind of lingering virus would die off. And then the next day we would have six lighting electricians coming into the space. And so because we were staggering our call times like that. And then beyond that, we were also taking into consideration um, offsetting our hours so that folks were not traveling during rush hour. And also um, partial unemployment, that for a lot of our crews who are subsisting on unemployment, we had staggered our call time so that um, each person wasn't working the full 40 hours so that they could still claim partial unemployment. And so like every combination of that in order to do the best that we could to protect our folks um, resulted in a 
four week loadout that would typically take four days in the middle of our season. Um, and so it definitely changed the way that we schedule and we structure the work that we do. But um, on the ground today, when you're talking to our folks, it didn't change all that much. I mean, there's a lot more disinfectant running around. There are Clorox wipes and sprays. And uh, we got an electrostatic sprayer, which makes you look like a ghost buster, which is really great. Um, so we're, there were a lot of adjustments made that way. Um, just being aware of um, who else is in the room when you're when you're there and stuff like that. And but I would say that um, our crews didn't necessarily feel the difference or the impact as much as we did kind of from the bird's eye view of the changes that we're making structurally to make sure that they're staying safe. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. It's really enlightening to hear it and really to think about breaking it down into those minute elements, in, including how to help people with regard to unemployment that are part of the, part of the, the team that we're working with and, and the safety and that it's a four week loadout instead of a four day loadout, which leads us a little bit into um, the costs of this. And you felt it firsthand from, from start to finish. I, I would imagine that budgetarily while eliminating a costume with a new test, there were other considerations and how do you, um, as you look back at it and also look forward at it, how do you feel like we might be able to proceed in a regional theater, which of course is gonna be very different than um, commercial? I think that the costs, what became clear to us was despite the fact that we have four theaters, we were not gonna be able to get into any of them. And so we invested in an enormous tent um, that could probably seat 400 and we were seating 50 comfortably with socially distance audience, you know, chairs. Um, so those costs and that are associated with putting a tent up, doing theater outdoors, the sound, the added sound elements. And like Hillary said, it was amazing. We only did one production. We normally do eight to 10 productions in the course of three or four months. And getting this one production up was like, you know, it was Godzilla. It was just an enormous undertaking. And, and the other thing I would say is that it was a real team effort. There are 20 year round staff members at Berkshire Theater Group and had we not all been working on the plan all the time for those three months, I'm not sure, I couldn't have done it alone and then hired people all of a sudden to come in. So the, the fact that theater is sort of teamwork all the time and there's an inherent focus in our work, you know, all for one and one for all, that, that worked amazingly well. It, what became clear to me was that despite the fact that I've been in theater for you know 40 years now, I never saw in such a raw way or fundamental way how important theater is to our lives. That was what I was able to see so clearly. I mean, it was just transparent on every level. That was the best part. Mm. And, and Kate, not just for the theater makers, for your audience, for community, for society, for a civilized world. Yes, for a civilized world. Exactly. Exactly. People would just hear the music. The actors would appear on stage. And I remember opening night, I was sitting next to my daughter, who's a performer, and her head just dropped. And she, I, I, you know, I looked at her and I said, Zadora, you all right? And she was weeping. And then I realized it was happening with everyone under the tent because they were back. Yes, necessary for a civilized world. Well put, Lauren. And thank you for sharing all of that with us. Ken, in a rehearsal studio, Singing, I'm going to imagine, being an additional risk, given what we know so far with science. How is that all being managed with space in the rehearsal studio? 
Well, um, our protocols state that everyone has to be in a mask at all times. And um, uh, things like blocking and singing are, te- are in our protocols of quote unquote core activity. And so we're allowed to, people are allowed to dance and um, be close to each other as long as they're wearing the mask all the time. If they're not wearing the mask, then they have to be you know, six to 10 feet apart away from each other. So, um, and like I said, this is what was developed with our, you know, Dr. Michaels and our safety expert, Brian Cole and Actors Equity and the League and all of that stuff. So um, it, it's, it's fine for the most part, but like I said, it is, it is hard when, you know, you, you know, you're singing and you're dancing and you're breathing very heavy and all you really want to do is rip the mask off because you can't breathe. But in, in, you know, in reality, you can't, you know, and, you know, there's someone like me who's coming and saying, hey, listen, can you do me a favor and just put your mask up or whatever. Um, but for the most part, everybody gets it. You know, everybody knows that it's necessary and um, everyone's doing their best. In the context of a rehearsal day with the equity rule at an hour, take a five minute break at 90 minutes, take a 10 minute break. Mm-hmm. What are your experiences with the actors being able to like, work that long? And, and are there um, safe areas where they may be able to go that they can actually take their mask off? Or for anybody, for all the staff and the crew, just like a place somewhere? That's a great question. We have a, our, uh, the room that we're rehearsing in, we're rehearsing in Open Jar Studios and their room is, uh, their studio, they have two gigantic studios. And we only have, um, 12 people, I think, in our company. So our, and we have another second smaller room that we've designated as a, um, a mask break room. So if anyone feels that they need to take their mask off for an extended period of time, they can go to that room and, you know, get a break. But um, there's room enough in the studio for everyone to be 20 feet away from each other if they need to pull their mask down and take a couple of breaths or to grab their water bottle take a couple of gulps of water. So we're very lucky in, in that way. And Kate, for you, um, with regard to rehearsal, as you think about rehearsals coming up and looking back at, at previous rehearsals for the actors who are exerting so much more than those sitting at the table. It, it's a similar situation um, to what Ken was talking about. Our actors, as long as they were socially distanced, could take their masks off. Um, and, and it was, there was just a period of adjustment at the beginning. And then they all sort of merged and, and got it. We all got it. Um, and so it became a little easier. And fortunately, I'm sure you experienced this too, Ken, our actors just bonded and realized or felt like they were doing something important and wanted to set the paces. And so they came together quite beautifully. Um, you know, theater people are usually to speak of themselves as a family, and that's what they became. It was really interesting in that way. Absolutely. It was a feeling of we're all in this together. Yeah. Absolutely. And Hillary, you're working with many of the same people at this point for many months. And we always hear the concept of COVID fatigue where we just get a little laxed, we get a little comfortable, we get a little familiar. Yeah, we're not in that person's bubble, but we're working with them every day. How does one manage the psychology of staying vigilant all the time? That's a great point. And I think that that is something that um, we're gonna continue kind of coming up against. But it's also the reason why people like myself and Ken are on site at all times. Um, I, th- I kind of touched on this earlier, but it, a key part, part of our um, safety protocols was emphasizing that um, COVID safety doesn't stop when you clock out. That every decision that you make, the moment that you leave here, impacts everyone who you come to work with. And so just reinforcing that um, staying safe outside of work is going to impact the work that you do here. And then beyond that, it is having COVID compliance officers on site. It is um, establishing a um, degree of mutual respect that this is new for everyone and that everyone's doing the best and learning as they can. And so um, if you see folks who are being lax with the rules and you feel comfortable, 
you can mention it to them. But if you don't, come to your COVID compliance officer and let them know so that we can address um, and remind folks of the new protocols that are in place. Um, so I'd, I'd kind of say that, that it's reminding them of community safety and then just really reinforcing this um, culture of respect um, and making sure that everyone is respecting each other um, enough to take their safety seriously and everyone else's. Mm. And Kate, in rehearsal, actually throughout the whole run, how did you manage like COVID compliance leadership? Was it a staffer, 10 or 12 people in different zones, particularly since you're the only one here who's had an audience? <laughs> So there were several bubbles and there was a person responsible for each bubble. Primarily responsible was the company manager who served like Ken in terms of the safety issues. And so if ever there was a question, someone would scream COVID pause, question would be asked, can I move this way? Does this need to be cleaned? A question would come up. So that, that was pretty constant. Someone would raise their hand. Um, but we had, I think there were six bubbles, front of house, production, actors, there were a variety of bubbles and whoever was the supervisor was responsible there. I think you've probably just coined a new term that is going to be used in many rehearsals and environments from here out and um, COVID pause the concept that anybody at any time potentially raises their hand and says out loud, COVID pause. Yes. Um, it was better than screaming. What the <laughs> hell is going on? <laughs> Ken, in your rehearsal environment, I know you've got all that great amount of real estate there, but does it seem like that might be something going forward when you're heading to more cast members and more crew and staff as part of the process? Um, yes. Um, I, I mean, I think that it, there's going to be a necessity because, you know, because there in our protocols, it said, it states that, you know, if a room is this big, the capacity is only this. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to have, you know, more people, it, it just stands to reason that you're going to have to have a, a bigger space. Um, mm -hmm. but also, you know, there, you know, ways to get, um, creative, you know, with things and, you know, especially like having another room is like a big help, certainly. But um, yeah, certainly having having a lot of space is is a, is a big help. And I think that that's that is going to be a necessity, you know, going forward, especially doing shows on a bigger scale, I think. Right. Right. It feels like um, time and space and money are going to become even more vital needs. Um, yeah. and all of them matter with regard to how safety is is achieved. Um, would each of you just say what you feel going forward would let us continue to go forward? Uh, looking back at what you've what you've experienced, had you known then what you know now, how might you have changed something with your COVID procedures in the process, Hillary? Um, that's a great question. I mean, knock on wood, we are more than two weeks out from our last day of large crews on set or on site. Um, and we haven't come back with any, um, positive tests or news of new symptoms. So, um, it seems like the work that we had done, um, has worked thus far. Um, I don't, think that I would have necessarily changed anything. Um, I just hope that we get to continue doing it. Um, I just hope that we get to a point where um, the positive, re like to the point where um, people across the nation start taking this as seriously as we do. Because um, the reality is, is like, if we don't take it seriously, we don't get to go back to work. Um, and so I hope that we continue on some path that allows us to um, like resume doing the stuff that we love to do, which is getting into rooms together and ideally seeing the bottom halves of other people's faces. Right, 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 right. And this is an okay time, I think, to say there's an election coming up 
vote, 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 get other people to vote, do what you can in every state, doesn't matter where or when. The election is now, it's not November 3rd. November 3rd is closing night. Um, Kate, you, you talked about the stress and it's impossible to fathom what you as a leader and your staff went through to make this kind of first musical and an equity environment happen during COVID. Are there ways that you feel going forward that that might be eased at all and take any of the pressure off? Well, I think that we realize now that, and, and I think we universally realize that if we wear masks and we socially distance and we wash our hands and be prudent, then we can get through this. Um, I wish I had known a little bit more about the tests, but how could I? Because it was all so new. There was so much that was new when we were, I mean, people kept saying we were the guinea pig, which I hated being called, but in a way we were. Um, I also realize, and it, and it, you know, I'm speaking to a little bit of what Hillary was talking about. I think more than anything, I'm afraid for our industry as a whole. And that so many are out of work and so many can't get health insurance. And I wish we could come together as a group. I wish that there were an arts and culture cabinet member. I wish that we were regarded as you spoke about in terms of the civilized world. What I did realize though, was that people did recognize what we did and that the donors and our board of trustees were absolutely remarkable through the process and so grateful and proud. And I, I'm sure that everyone is aching to get back into it. Um, so if I could do a fundraising pitch for all of us, we absolutely need the support of all of our donors at this point, and we need the support of state government and federal government to finally recognize the arts for who we are. You know, in Massachusetts, you can get a prescription to come to our theater. It's this new thing that the State Arts Council put together. You, abs you can go to your doctor and get a prescription because it's good for you. It's good health, which is just great, I think. Extraordinary and something we can all learn from. And I'm um, voting for you to be filling that first cabinet spot. Regardless. <laughs> um, you, um, you alluded to a question that an audience member had asked, and it was about what can what can theater doers go to help? And I think this is the perfect time to address it. Kate, do you wanna take that question? I think that it's important for us to talk about what theater means to our lives and that it's not about my sitting at a dinner table anymore and a parent saying to me, oh my God, my child wants to go to the theater. How can I discourage them? They're gonna be poor for the rest of their lives. There needs to be a fundamental shift in the way we value art and the artist in this country and how we support the artist. And perhaps through this period of time, we will recognize what we're missing in our lives, but more need to do what Ken is doing, what Hillary is doing, and what we did with Godspell. I think there are more theaters working and operating right now and trying to get back to it. Because as soon as someone is in it again, it, it's life-changing for them all over again. That's incredible. And so speaking about it as part of our daily lives becomes more important. How many of us have education programs where we're impacting kids and transforming their lives? It just needs to be part of the discussion. And yes, vote, please. <laughs> and really the only way we do get back is for that marriage of art and science. Mm -hmm. and huge, huge respect to the science element of this. And while so many people are out of work, 
and so many others aren't being exposed to the arts that would otherwise be created and what that does to humanity we are in desperate need and desire of science leading the way on this which can of course you're feeling in the rehearsal studio right now and how that is being managed do you find that the science hurts the art um yeah. oh, that's a really good question and it's a it's it's a line you know it's a line that that you know, you, you have to you have to figure out how to tiptoe across in in the rehearsal room. You know, um, you know, you know. Last week, our, our our test results didn't come in, and so we had to stop rehearsal to go and to go to a rapid testing center to get tested. So, um, yes, there is absolutely the potential for it to happen. But what I find amazing is that the artists in the room, and I include the director and the choreographer. Um, all are making it a part of, of what they're doing. You know what I'm saying? Like there's not one person in the room who's like, well, I can't do this or I can't do that. They're like, let's all do this together and let's continue to create art. And the most important thing is that we're together and we're creating art. And so let that be the one thing that we are uh, looking at in this time. You know what I mean? And and so it's it's also it's also a mindset, you know what I'm saying? And so um you know, choosing, we're all choosing to look past that as much as we can. Mm. Alicia, is that the perfect segue? I think that is. Um, we've got uh, about five more minutes left, so I'm gonna squeeze in some some audience audience questions that they, they've had for this panel as you've had this wonderful conversation. Uh, the first being props. Um, how do you all handle props, especially those that are cloth based or can't be wiped down as well as those with solid surfaces, just something that might be passed from actor to actor or obviously that can't happen now. So just talk about props a little bit if you would. That's a really good question. Um, I have about 17 different types of disinfectant. <laughs> um, alcohol wipes, Clorox wipes, I have a disinfecting spray, I have um, spray nine, I can tell you exactly how long each of them takes to kill the COVID virus. Um, and so things are wiped down, sprayed down on a daily basis. As far as we do have props that get handed from actor to actor and, you know, it could be me running around, you know, in, in between them running a number with a squirt bottle of hand sanitizer, making sure that everyone is sanitizing in between the times that we're running a number, but after, you know, we, the number is done for the day, then all of those things get um, uh, disinfected and put away in an airtight box until they're used again. So um, yeah, disinfect, 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 hand sanitizer, you know what I mean? I mean, we're, or, but also, you know, we're also working on live theater. So, you know, there's also scripts, there's scores, there are dance arrangements to be made, you know what I'm saying? And so, you know, it's just about, you know, sanitizer and people being as safe as they can. Specifically about the uh, COVID compliance officer training, um, I wonder what you can sh what that process was like and where folks could go to find some resources. We've had a lot of questions about that, um, and in particular, of what kind of what what that training will allow them to do. One of the things that is really interesting about that right now is that it's the wild, wild west. There is no one training that then says to a producer or a general manager, I am trained and skilled at this. I've gotten my equity card, as it were. It's, it's, it's not that. Um, there are, a, at the moment, there's about a half a dozen training programs that range from about 45 minutes to hours, and they cost anywhere from $0 to about 450 None of them authorize anyone to then be high. It's not like getting a college degree or an EMT. And I think that what we want to be really keenly aware of is how um, unmonitored that is right now. For anybody who's doing anything in the arts or working with other people, to have any of that training is just wonderfully valuable. It can hurt. And yeah. The, the way that I'll add to that, Lauren, is that um, 
there are a lot of like online courses. I can send Melissa and Alicia the link to the health education services one, um, which like is a $50, I think it was like a three hour seminar, which is not going to teach you all of the like, um, all of the science behind coronavirus, but it is going to reaffirm a lot of the practical um, things that you need to know about keeping safe. Um, and it doesn't, the presence of COVID compliance officers doesn't take away the need to have someone with medical training on site, but health and safety compliance teams are becoming more and more necessary. It's not just one person, it's usually a team that has to cover multiple locations. And so like, like Ken and like I know other, others in our industry are, it's worth the investment. It's worth getting, taking that $50 training course, getting on a list of COVID compliance officers and having your name out there as someone who could be hired to join one of these teams. And typically what you're doing is um, monitoring a space, setting up social distancing tape markers, you're setting up signage, setting up air filters and things like that. And just really participating in that entire portion of, and you'll usually be led by another COVID compliance officer, led by someone with medical training, like a nurse or an EMT. Um, at least that is my understanding of the most of the practices so far. And so people are definitely hiring. People are definitely hiring folks who are interested in, who are familiar with either film or theater and are interested in filling that health and safety role. If anybody is kind of twiddling their thumbs thinking, what else might I want, want to do in my career and want to stay in this business and feeling like, oh, I'm young, I have a choice to make some other choices. Medical training is not a bad way to go. I know it sounds crazy, but there's going to be a lot of opportunity. And you guys already know stage left from stage right and upstage and downstage. And the medically trained people don't. And there's confusion among them. And it challenges the process. Great. I don't know if Ken or Kate, you have anything to add about kind of the, the, the world of train, uh, COVID compliance training, um, what it taught you, what you learned from that process or anything like that. I know, Kate, you said your company manager went through that process. I'm not sure if you did as well. The one that Hillary was talking about, the health and education. I think that's the one that Actors' Equity is recommending right now as well. That's so, the one I did as well, ma'am. Got it. Perfect. So yeah, we, we can send you more information about that, the link to it. Um, but otherwise, we're at time. Uh, this conversation could go on much longer as there's a lot, a lot of new things we're all learning together um, as an industry about how to, how to handle this and move forward with it. Um, so with that, thank you, Lauren, for moderating this conversation. Thank you, Hillary, Kate, and Ken for sharing your insights and experiences with us. Um, we really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who tuned in at home um, and anyone who is watching this after the fact, uh, we appreciate you signing on for this. Um, and so until next time, take care, be well, have a good night, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hugs to all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having us. Have a good night. Good night. Have a good night. Blessings to the American Theater Wing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.